about the werewolf in the 16th and 17th centuries in Europe. This is pretty much how it's seen. This is the sort of the ravening um, creature who, who takes maidens and that sort of thing. The werewolf and the changing into a human being as a motif um, has existed in so many cultures and in so many different environments that it would be very difficult to cover it completely uh, in a whole evening. You've got Norse berserkers changing into bears and things like that. So we're going to confine it down to a couple of centuries during the great witch hunts in Europe. This is the earliest literary werewolf I can find. This is Wagner the werewolf, um, which was a penny dreadful in the mid-19th century. Fantastic illustration. Uh, you've, got, you've got this, this inspired a Golden Age comic, that's probably, that's 1940s, I would imagine that one. Um, we've got this lovely illustration from a, a Dumas book, which is, has, explicitly has a werewolf standing there, actually standing up addressing this man. Uh, this is from a film that you probably all know. Anybody know the film? American Werewolf, of course, an absolute classic, brilliant, brilliant film. And uh, this is slightly more obscure, but really, really good. Has anyone seen this one? Brotherhood of the Wolf. Brotherhood of the Wolf, yeah, well done. And um, uh, it's, it's at the bottom there. You, has, anybody, have, has anybody not seen it? Oh, okay, I won't spoil it then. <laughs> I won't spoil it. The bottom is a kind of a reveal, and it's an absolutely amazing uh, French language film, if you ever get to see it. It, um, it kind of involves uh, the Beast of Jourdain, which is about a century later than the, the, the time that we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, but it's, you know, it's an absolutely superb film. And then there's this one. Anyone recognise that? Yes, Company of Wolves. Um, a film I, I don't think it quite stands up to modern scrutiny quite as much, but certainly some very lovely fairy tale bits and, and absolutely superb makeup effects. So you can see that the concept of the werewolf has inspired an awful lot of fantastic art and this. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, this, this one was for my niece. Um, she insisted, but you know, what are you going to do? So, Sabon Baring Gould pointed out in the 19th century that in, the sh in north, north of Europe, uh, the shape of a bear, and in Africa, the shape of a hyena were more often selected in preference. It was a mere matter of taste. The idea that people could change into animal shapes um, it appears across the world, across cultures, and the, just the, the choice of animal depends on the environment. So we have things like, what's this? That's a tiger, yep, a wet tiger, and you do get wet tigers. This is hyena, yep, where hyenas, you get where hyena folklore in Africa. This one? A jackal, yeah. I wouldn't have got that one unless I'd researched it. I knew about jackals, I didn't know what jackals looked like. So, um, yep, so you do get where jackals. And what is it that unites all of these creatures? <coughs> Predators, yeah, they're, they're all they're all carnivores, they're all top level predators, which is exactly why this <laughs> is an intrinsically amusing concept. And um, there are there are, in Europe there are slight exceptions. You get witches um, accused of being changed into cats, uh, which are also top level predators, even though they're they're titchy. Um, but they, they get accused of being changed into hares as well. But the thought of an animal, of a person changing into an animal which is not a top level predator is, is unusual -ish in, in folklore really. So we're looking at the, um, at the top level predators. What we look at with modern literary werewolves I think is probably is, is the darkness inside the human soul. It's basically outsourcing your evil. Um, it's a way of saying that it was Mr Hyde instead of Dr Jekyll. Uh, and and that's, those are the kind of motifs that we get, and it's also the kind of motifs that we get when we look at the 16th and 17th centuries, the kind of thing that we're going to look at this evening. Now, what does lycanthropy actually mean? If somebody said lycanthropy or accused someone of were being a werewolf in our, um, in, in our chosen era, the 16th and 17th centuries, what would that actually mean? Well, it, um, we're going to look at three areas. The first thing is lycanthropy as a medical condition, as actually a condition of mental health. Uh, we've got this from John Webster. It's something from the Duchess of Malfi that was written in 1614, and it's actually quite a bizarre little excerpt. Um, it's, the doctor says, and this is entirely a subplot, this isn't the point of the play at all, the doctor says, um, in those that are possessed with uh, 
it, this condition, that overflows such melancholy humour that they imagine themselves to be transformed into wolf, into wolves. They steal forth into churchyards in the dead of night and dig up dead bodies as two nights since the Duke, who is the person they're discussing uh, in, in this play, about midnight and are laying behind St Mark's Church with the leg of a man upon his shoulder and he, he howled fearfully. He said he was a wolf, only the difference was a wolf's skin was hairy on the outside, his on the inside. He bade them to take their swords, rip off his flesh, and try. Straight I was sent for, and have administered to him, found his grace very well recovered. So to, to our eyes, that seems like a completely bizarre group of circumstances and situations to put together. There's a bloke who thinks he's a wolf, although he doesn't look like that to everybody outside. He insists that the hair of, of the wolf is on the inside of his skin, but it is still present. And he's walking down the street with a corpse leg over his shoulder. But having been looked after, tended to by the doctor, he gets better and returns to mental health. So you would think, wow, John Webster had a hell of an imagination. In actual fact, um, I, I found a lot of uh, sources for the kinds of ideas around at the time. The first one is The Anatomy of Melancholy by Robert Burton, and that was a contemporary sort of psychiatric manual. Um, they used the humoral uh, model at that time where you had the four humours which had to be in balance in order for people to be perfectly in health. And he said that lycanthropia or wolf madness is when men run around howling in graves and fields in the night and they'll not be persuaded but that they are wolves or some such beasts. Um, I should refer to it as a madness as most do. Um, not all, it wasn't a completely uncontroversial diagnosis but it was mainstreamish. So, you know, it wasn't just Robert Burton. Uh, they lie hid most part of the day and go abroad in the night barking, howling at graves and deserts. Uh, they usually have hollow eyes, scabbed legs and thighs, very dry and pale. So in a mainstream psychiatric textbook, they are describing, someone is describing the symptoms and the kind of subjective reality of this <coughs> person, what they think. Um, Simon Goulard also was a, a French doctor and he spent a lot of time in, in um, Switzerland. And he wrote about a man who he had encountered. I've observed one of these melancholy lycanthropes, and he knew me well. Um, being one day troubled with his disease and meeting me, I retired to a part, fearing that he should hurt me. So this guy was, was clearly behaving a bit strangely. It was something to be scared of. Uh, having eyed me a little, he passed me, and being followed by a troop of people, he carried upon his shoulders the whole thigh and leg of a dead man, just like the Duke and the Duchess of Malfi. Being carefully looked unto, cared for, he was cured of this disease. Meeting me another time, he asked me if I had not been afraid, when as he encountered me in such a place, which makes me think his memory was, it was not hurt nor impaired. So this man was um, going through a lycanthropic attack, and even though his perceptions of what was reality at the time were disturbed, nonetheless, he did have a, a correct memory, his perceptions. He, he identified Simon Goulart, and he remembered it well enough. So um, Simon Goulart gives a very lucid account there, really of uh, the different perceptions in the situation. Um, Job Finsell, this is, this is via Goulart, about uh, something that happened which was a great deal more tragic. There was a countryman in Pavia in the year 1541 who thought himself to be a wolf, um, settled upon diverse men in the fields and slew some. In the end, with great difficulty, he was taken, and he did constantly affirm that he was a wolf. He absolutely insisted he was a wolf, having killed some men. Uh, and that he was a wolf between the skin and the flesh. Now this idea is called verisipilis in Latin, and the idea is that somebody really has that sort of the, the, the soul part of a wolf, but that you can't see it, but the, the fur is there. So Goulart is quite judgmental here, and I think it, his judgment would probably accord with ours as well. Some barbarous and cruel wolves in effect, desiring to try the truth of that, gave him many wounds upon the arms and legs. Um, they eventually realised that they were in error, that man was actually suffering a psychotic episode, that he didn't have any fur growing on the inside at all, and that they had been the irresponsible ones trying out such a ridiculous theory. Um, they, they killed him. They, they, uh, he died. So he was committed to the surgeons to cure, but um, he died a few days later. So we can see those three really peculiar things in the Duchess of Malfi actually in contemporary non-fiction accounts. So we can see that lycanthropy was an excuse for kind of a, a transient psychotic episode. Um, and this is an illustration by Louis Cranach, the, uh, the elder, and it, it, sh it shows this 
quite well. There's um, a man there, he's taking a baby off in, in his mouth. Uh, but he's on all fours like a wolf, and he clearly, he hasn't been portrayed as a wolf, he's been portrayed as a rather disarrayed man. So nobody is saying, if somebody is suffering from lycanthropy like, as a mental condition, that they actually change into a wolf. They're saying that, that they're a person who's suffering from a transient psychotic episode. Now, psychopaths as lycanthropes, we see that occasionally as well. It's just such an insult to say to somebody, well, you're just you're such a wolf. To, um, uh, so you could use it as a, as a label of abuse. And if somebody did something that was so completely antisocial and separate and awful, then you would, they could say he was a lycanthrope. There's the case of the werewolf of Chalon, who was tried by the Parliament of Paris in December 1598. Now, the thing about the werewolf of Chalon was that he was actually a tailor, but they found a cask of bones in his shop. And these casks of bones turned out to be the bones of children. He was actually, he was a serial killer. Um, unfortunately for us, the judges ordered the trial records to be burned. They were so appalled by this. So we will never know, um, we'll never know whether or not they actually thought he changed into a wolf, or whether they were just using this as to describe an absolutely undescribable and dreadful crime. And the third category, by far the largest category, is lycanthropy as witchcraft. Now the 15th and 16th centuries were an enormously active time for witch accusations. And there are um, many reasons for this. These are the people I can find who were accused of actually specifically lycanthropy. If, if I can find these and people were you know, burning trial records because they were so aghast and just the trial records were getting lost as a matter of course anyway, then <laughs> there were clearly more people than this um, being killed for lycanthropy or tried for lycanthropy. Certainly many, many, many being tried and tried for witchcraft in Europe. So why the 16th and 17th centuries? Um, what people have asked is, is <laughs> where did that come from? Where's that picture come from? The Holy, the Holy Grail, yeah. Was it the Holy Grail? Or, oh yeah, it was the Holy Grail, yeah. And um, basically you can tell that they are peasants um, because the uniform of peasants is covered in shit, I think. The, <laughs> yes, that was it. Uh, so was this, did this come from the bottom up? Was, it, was this all the peasants who believed in supernatural things or getting together and accusing people and, and sort of just creating a general format? Um, or was this from the top down. <laughs> and who's that? That's Lord Melchett, yes. And this is the right era, actually, because Lord Melchett served at Elizabeth's court, so he would have been a 16th century gentleman. So, or was it the important sort of educated people at the top, fewer in number, of course, but who, who had these intellectual ideas about things and were actually causing them to filter further down into the system? Well, in fact, actually, it was probably top down because people have always believed in supernatural things. It's um, a necessary but not sufficient reason for a witch hunt. Uh, people have believed, people still do believe in supernatural phenomena. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to go around looking for witches or have a sort of some major social thing going on related to witchcraft. And the circumstances that we tend to look at, there were climatic reasons undoubtedly um, that contributed to the to that being a difficult era when the mini ice age started in Europe at about kind of um, 1550 or so, lasted through to 1850. So there were lost harvests and the usual kinds of things that upset people. But in general, um, something worth looking at is the fact that the Inquisition had been set up in response to Catharism and it went through several phases. The Dominicans were left without a, a mission. And once a very wise friend of mine said that if you've got a hammer, everything sure starts to look like a nail. And so the Dominicans were there with their heresy hammer and the possibility that they were going to be left with nothing to do. Um, the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation happened at this time. There had been many attempts at the Reformation and attempts at trying to stop the complete authority of the Catholic Church. Uh, it had always been a part of the, the landscape. Now it actually started to work, it started to happen. And you can see from this map that they say sort of at the beginning of um, the Reformation, before the Reformation, if you take everything on the left there as being all Catholic, and then in the middle, the midway of the Reformation, you can see Protestantism has bloomed in various places. And then at the end, 
um, Catholic, the Protestantism has retracted a little bit. And so you can see these liminal areas, which must have been very interesting for 150 years or so, uh, during that phase in which the Reformation was officially reckoned to have actually happened. Uh, where you, you, things were changing all the time, perhaps more than once or twice. And um, in the post-Renaissance phase, we had the birth pangs of, of uh, modernity. Uh, Gutenberg's printing press started producing stuff in the 1440s. And of course, it became absolutely, in, massively important uh, for the Enlightenment and for the, idea, the spread of religious ideas and all sorts of changes of ideas. But of course, it was equally used to print witch hunting manuals too. So um, if you've got a, a source of information, a medium, then you're going to get all kinds of information coming through. It meant that the witch hunters' manuals could get disseminated more easily, as well as all of the, um, the, the sort of enlightenment uh, scientific stuff that would come later. So what we have here is in 1487, there's the first great, well, actually, it's the second great witch hunting manual. Um, the first one was probably Nidus Formicarius, but the Malleus Maleficarum was tremendously influential. It's also incredibly misogynistic. I mean, it's a hideous thing to read. And um, it, was, it was very popular for a while, dipped for a little while, and then became very popular again. Uh, there are many books that, were cite that are citable as being very influential at the time. There's the Formicarius that I mentioned at the top there. Uh, Jean Baudin was very influential. <coughs> King James I believed very fervently in witches and managed to stir up an awful lot of um, uh, feeling against them before he finally changed his mind, which didn't help all the people who had their fingernails pulled out and um, all of their relatives burned. Uh, you've got um, Henri Bouget, who writes a lot about werewolves um, and, and these kinds of things. There, there were a couple of people at the time, and this is why this is why we mustn't think that people in former times were all gullible and superstitious. There were people at the time who were writing anti-witch hunting manuals. They weren't necessarily in line with our modern ideas, our modern materialistic ideas of the world. But nonetheless, they were talking and denouncing the uh, talking about and denouncing the worst excesses of the witch hunts. And a couple of examples of these are Reginald Scott and Johann Ware. Johann Ware was under the um, protection of the Duke of Cleves. And couldn't have done it without that. You needed somebody who was actually batting for you, who was higher in the social hierarchy, who was looking after you. Uh, we saw John Bodan earlier. I think it was Reginald Scott said something like, "What what these what they did was that these." These manuals would quote each other, so they would say, "Oh, of course, as you know, as, you know, as Cameron and Springer said, and as, as Nida said." And so, really, what they were doing was uh, it looked very much, I suppose, like modern academic citations, where they would be constantly quoting each other, but there was no external sources. They were all sort of they were all bowing, they, they were all holding each other up by each other's quotations. So it was this sort of like constant little incestuous references, um, really with nothing but hearsay and everything at the bottom of it. And uh, Reginald Scott said that, um, you know, <coughs> if something was attested to by Bodan's witnesses, it's a shame that all the witnesses of Bodan are such liars. So, <laughs> so they were being really snarky about each other at the time, and there were people going against witchcraft, but it really did depend on the area that you were in as to whether or not you happened to find yourself in a place where <coughs> witchcraft was being prosecuted and being believed in. Now, I made a little map of all of the werewolf uh, trials that I could find in France, because France is, is quite a country for it. Now, do you notice anything in general, <laughs> in general, about where the werewolves are? <laughs> they're, are they all Swiss? Yeah, they're Swiss. They're up to everything, aren't they? Um, they're, they're getting towards <laughs> Switzerland. <laughs> but in general... It's mountain. Mountains, yes, yeah, mountains. Um, this one down here, the, these, these werewolves were the work of one man, so it just shows you what an enthusiast can do. That was, uh, he, he was just a very, very, um, you know, enthusiastic witch hunter. Oh, God love him. And um, that one up there is a total aberration, really. But apart from that, you know, you've, you've, you've got these going off towards Switzerland, they're all in the mountains. And the thing is that it's a matter of using whatever motifs and themes that you have in your environment to express the worst evil that you have. There's not much point talking about wolves to somebody 
who at the time lived in England because it was, they knew what wolves were, but they would probably have gone their whole lives without actually seeing one. Um, that certainly didn't mean anything to them, whereas people in mountains can represent evil as wolves very easily because the wolves probably were coming down and nicking their livestock during cold winters. Um, you can see here, this guy says, for goodness sake, man, snap out of it, we're not aliens from outer space, we're pixies, pixies from the garden. Is that so difficult to understand? <laughs> so this man clearly has just suffered from a bout of sleep paralysis, and he's mistaken it for um, alien intrusion, which people do. And the pixies are putting him right, because as we all know, um, pixies cause sleep paralysis. Uh, has, everybody, has everybody known, does everybody know about sleep paralysis? Anybody doesn't? No, so you know you can have some pretty hideous and compelling supernatural experiences and that they have been ascribed to various supernatural creatures over the, uh, over the centuries. Um, so just remember it's the pixies. <laughs> so the first case we're going to look at, we're going to look at a few cases so that we can get an idea of, of what really was underneath, what was behind this thing of werewolves being... Um, which, which trials and people being accused of being werewolves. Now, the first one was the werewolves of Poligny, um, and they were tried by the Inquisitor General of um, uh, Bessancon, Bessancon, sorry, in, the fif in 1521, and there were three men called uh, Michel Verdun, uh, Pierre Bourgeau, and uh, Philippe Almento. Now, the thing about this account was that they were tried by the Inquisitor General, so we do see the Dominican influence there. He was a Dominican friar. Um, and it was written in retrospect. We get this account from um, Bouget, and it was written in kind of 1590-ish, uh, um, something like that. So he was, he was remembering this. We don't have the direct records. He was uh, recalling this. Now, the, theme about, the other theme about this was that they were tortured. I said something at QED. I said, if you tortured me, I would admit that I had Spice Girl records. Somebody no. on Twitter took that to mean I have Spice Girl. <laughs> I do not. Yeah. I do not. What I'm saying is I would make a line. Yes. <laughs> yes. I would admit to anything. So, um, so I don't have Spice Girl records for the record. Um, but of course you'll say anything, you know. And, and so often they say, it's a euphemism in, in the literature. Oh, so-and-so was shown the instruments of torture, which probably means they snagged a fingernail or two on the way out. You know, it's sort of, the torture obscures the, um, the story in, in, in every case. And, and we know that now as well. Uh, and, and a lot of people knew it at the time and, and wrote about it, but it didn't stop it being used. So probably the reason why this is such a fanciful account is because torture was involved. Um, and they claimed to have a magic salve, which they put on them, a magic ointment from Satan that turned them into wolves and then turned them back into humans again. So that's an interesting theme that, that, um, that comes back, uh, comes up again and again. Now, the, the other thing about this, and we get this in films as well, is uh, Pierre Bourgeau, actually, no, it's Michel Verdun, uh, the way that they found out about all of these werewolves was that one of them was walking through the forest uh, there was a traveller walking through the forest and he was attacked by this big wolf and the traveller managed to wound the wolf. The wolf yelped and ran away and then he tracked the wolf down to a hut and he found a man being tended by his wife and the man had a wound on the same part of his body where he had um, wounded the wolf. So this was all part of the evidence which is you know, of course, this wolf changed into a man because he had the wound on the same place in his body. So there was a whole area of, uh, of um, academia given over to exactly how a person could physically change into a wolf because it seemed improbable. Um, now, Gilles Garnier was another one. He, uh, his case was in 1573. Uh, and with this, it's different. We're not looking so much in arrears at this one. We know we've got information at the time that something was going on. We don't know what it was, but there was a proclamation from the local parliament um, basically allowing people to go out with weapons and look for a wolf. So we know that people were being attacked, probably children or livestock. So we don't know whether or not it was actually a human agent, like a serial killer, or whether it was a rogue wolf. But at least there is something of a chain of evidence to say that something was actually really going on. Um, now, the way that they caught Garnier was, uh, 
was that one girl was saved. She was quite small. She was um, she was about five, and uh, somebody, a, a group of peasants, ran towards this uh, attack as it was happening, and somebody recognised. Uh, Jean Garnier, who was a local man, in this wolf's features. They chased the wolf away, but somebody said, that looked like Jean Garnier. <laughs> uh, so, can a man change shape? It's an interesting thought. Um, the Compendium Maleficarum of Guazo said that the devil deceives our senses in various ways. Sometimes he substitutes another body while the witches themselves are absent or hidden apart in some secret place. And he assumes the body of the wolf from, from the air and wraps it around him and does those actions which men think are done by the wretched uh, absent witch who is asleep. He surrounds a witch with an aerial effigy of a beast, each part of which fits onto the corresponding parts of the witch's body. But this only happens when they use certain ointments and words. So you had two models there, and in, uh, here we are now onto explicitly the area of people aren't writing off lycanthropy as a metaphor or an explanation for anything they are saying. People change into wolves, and this is how they do it, the mechanism. Either the, uh, the, the person goes to sleep, and the devil goes out and does everything in the form of a wolf that they are ascribing to the, to the witch, or he, the devil surrounds the witch with an aerial effigy, so it just looks as though the person is a wolf. So this is, this is the alleged scientific mechanism by which a person changes into a wolf. And it's, it's from the kind of, um, they start with the first principles that only God can create life, a perfect life. You, you get this quite a lot in mythology, that if some dark force creates some sort of life, then there's some imperfection in it. Like the devil's always got a limp if he, uh, if he turns up in person, because he can't be perfect because he hasn't been created by God. Um, again from Guazo, uh, we've got, um, it's no matter for wonder if they are afterwards found with an actual wound in those parts of their human body where they were wounded, um, because the enveloping air easily yields and the true body receives the wounds. So when a witch really does go out and has been sort of given their, their wolfy hologram by the devil, then they still get wounded. Alternatively, if the witch is not bodily present, the devil wounds her in the part of the absent body corresponding to the wound received by the beast's body. So this was a way of explaining scientifically how you could actually get sympathetic wounding and metamorphosis. People did take the trouble to actually work out the logic of it. Um, so the thing about Gilles Garnier was uh, they recognised Garnier's features in the wolf. Now he was an outsider from Lyon and he's, he was disliked for his personal manner too. So he may well have been antisocial, he may well have been killing local children. It's very hard to say, we don't know. Um, in English witchcraft trials, uh, it, you quite often had people, the poorest people, um, and outsiders actually turned on for scapegoating purposes. So it may well be that he was perfectly innocent and they just didn't like him. They didn't like his, his wife, Apolline, either. Um, and he was very poor. I mean, if, if you're going to really just turn around on somebody and scapegoat them and be really horrible to them, um, better to make sure that they're not particularly rich or influential because then it could turn around and it could bounce back on you. So we don't know, in short, we don't know with Gilles Garnier, but it's, there's more of a chance there that there was actually an antisocial perpetrator within the community who was a serial killer and they just, they said werewolf because it's a great label for what he was doing. Um, now, Peter Stubb is the third one we're going to look at tonight. That was in 1583 and this is something different. This, Peter Stubb, for a start, was uh, in Weber in Germany. Um, now they, they said the devil gave unto him a girdle which he put about him and he was straight away transformed into the likeness of a greedy devouring wolf strong and mighty with eyes great and large which in the night sparkled unto browns of fire a mouth great and wide with most sharp and cruel teeth a huge body and mighty paws the whole province was feared by the, cru the cruelty of this bloody and devouring wolf again it would be nice Apparently, Peter Stubb the werewolf had been terrorising the area for 25 years prior to being caught. If we had the reference for people being taken off, perhaps for adults being attacked, or for livestock being taken in larger than normal numbers, or perhaps for children being killed, that would help us as sceptics to go, well, something was happening. But a key part of the whole Peter Stubb story is that this was actually just collected together all at the same time in a 16-page um, booklet. And that 16-page booklet was printed, there aren't any more German uh, 
um, examples of it, but it was translated into English and there are two copies in England. So that's how we know about it, and it's very much, it's a narrative, it's a story it, by then. Somebody has taken, somebody's put it together, and it actually does end up looking like a bit of propaganda. Um, now, they found, that, that, this is something that interests me, they, they, they got the court records, they memorised in the pictures carved in brass, which are for sale. So they had, they had torture porn back in those days. They had torture souvenirs. This um, Peter stuff met the most dreadful, dreadful end. And if this is the image that I'm thinking of, that I'll show you a bit later, then people were buying it for amusement type purposes. Uh, of course, the thing with saw and all that kind of thing is it's actually fiction. <coughs> people were buying this for the um, for the visceral frissons of it when actually a real man had, had been through it. Now he was accused of incest with his daughter, sister and a succubus. So for anybody who just thinks Viagra was invented uh, 10 or 20 years ago, um, there was clearly something around then that was helping him out. And this to me makes him sound like a pantomime villain, for never was known a wretch from nature so far degenerate. He didn't just have one element of his personality which was bad. He was just, he was, he was lascivious with, with several family members and a succubus. He was a dreadful, dreadful man. The, book is, the booklet is overwritten in such a way that you start to think, is this propaganda? Um, he was uh, explicitly in the likeness of a wolf. So we're not talking about any metaphors here. They accused him of changing into a wolf. Uh, and he was hunted with the aid of dogs. He slipped his belt, the thing that made him into a wolf, and changed back into a man. And the reason that this is interesting to me was that they caught him while he was in the form of a man. And uh, they sent him, they, they sent some men to look for this belt, which he must have slipped off. And you know how with conspiracy theories, that basically if one thing happens, the conspiracy theorist, theorist believes in their theory, and then if completely the opposite thing happens, the conspiracy theorist believes in their theory, the fact that Peter Stubb's belt disappeared and yet he was still a werewolf, um, they said that the belt must have gone back to Satan from whence it came, just proves to me that they really weren't entertaining any other hypotheses at all. Um, the booklet says that he was threatened with torture but confessed. So. You know, we, we, we don't know if there were fingernails or teeth um, involved there, but in any case, uh, I think most of us would just confess having seen the instruments of torture. Basically, torture was involved. So this court said that Peter Stubb, by his nature, being inclined to blood and cruelty, so there was a bit of mud slinging there, um, and then they sentenced him to have his body laid on a wheel and with red hot burning pincers in ten several places to have the, the flesh pulled off from the bones, his legs and arms to be broken with a wooden axe or hatchet, afterwards to have his head struck from his body. Now I've read about a lot of witch trials, but that is a really, really sadistic sentence. And I, um, I sort of marvel at, at the double think of someone who can accuse someone else of being bloody and inclined to cruelty and then hand that down as a sentence. Um, that's actually the, the picture that was probably the one that was printed and at the end there he is being sort of boiled and burnt and goodness knows what else. Um, so the interesting thing is that he suffered death accordingly in the town of Bedborough in the presence of many peers and princes of Germany. Now how many peers and princes do you think turn out for your average witch burning or witch hanging as it was here? It actually wasn't that many. It's a clue that it's a clue that there was something major going on. That he was actually this was a prominent case, and that he was a prominent man. And if we look again at this map that we looked at earlier, you can see the little red dot that I've put in there. And actually, it started out as Catholic, it went Protestant, and came back to being Catholic again. So, in fact, with Peter Stubb, the chances are really that he was an eminent member of society in Bedborough and that this was actually a political murder. This was a way of saying to everybody, don't change your ways again because this is the price. So it was more than likely a, a phenomenon of the Reformation. Everything focused on this one man and he got accused of really awful things. Um, so really, if, what I would say is we could learn, I suppose if, if you read my blog, the thing, I, bang on about all the time is we can learn so much about ourselves and we can learn so much about our present situation based 
on historical situations. This isn't about things that are far away because we're still human beings. This is ultimately about us. Uh, so I would say, in general, watch during times of social and economic uphe upheaval for scapegoating behaviour. That's what happened during the Reformation. You had scapegoating, you had witch hunts, all that kinds of thing. So it, it's whenever there's an economic downtime, downturn, just just watch, just be careful for it. Um, especially that directed towards the vulnerable. Um, in Scotland, for example, they, they quite often accuse the nobility of witchcraft too. It varies at different places. But in England and in many other places in Europe, they just took the lowliest beggars that they could find and um, got at them because they were could. They, they, they could. And also you can you you know you can have a go at people like that relatively without impunity. And also people like that are a drain on your resources too. If you want to do some kind of morally justifiable ethnic cleansing, these are the kinds of ways that people do it. They sort of um, come up with ideas in their head about how it's okay because she's a witch. Uh, that definitely happened in, in England. Uh, beware of the educated and influential talking bollocks. Very important because obviously we all talk bollocks all of the time, but the kinds of bollocks that we just verbal at at the bottom just goes on all the time. Really, if you're looking at pivotal educated people starting to spread the stuff from above, that's when you really get serious, nasty stuff going on. Um, in the case of the War Boys witches, for example, uh, there was a man called um, Roger Knoll, who uh, actually known as Throckmorton in the case of the War Boys witches. Um, he, he, he had read all the demonology li um, you know, manuals and he thought he knew what was going on. And he ended up he ended up escalating the situation to the point where um, three people all from the same family uh, ended up dying. Um, in the case of the Lancashire witches, that was Roger Noel, uh, far more people ended up dying. And in each case, it was this, this sort of middle class, empowered person who was very educated, read all the right manuals, was literate, thought they knew what was going on, and they imposed this kind of top-down schema on all of the confessions. Um, where people were confessing to things that they they probably wouldn't have heard of otherwise. Uh, but the, it was going through this, this filter, and it's a tremendously important thing to remember. This is something where I think with accusations of um, modern witchcraft in um, evangelical African churches uh, against children, where really the most effective intervention you could make is to go for the pastors, because a, a pastoral is always sort of a little cut above the rest of his um, congregation, educationally and influentially, and if you went for those people and, and you know you had you made a law so it was illegal to accuse people under 18 of being witches, um, and you certainly made it illegal to charge for exorcisms, then uh, then you would you would cut the legs off a lot of this stuff, not all of it obviously, but off a lot of it. So aim to at those people. Um, and witchcraft is not a separate thing from conventional religion, it's produced by it. I mean, if you look at witchcraft uh, manuals and, and the trials from the 16th and 17th centuries, it's almost as though the witch is just doing everything anti the normal Christian person. So you've got your normal good behaviour and then just the, witchcraft is do the witch is doing anything that's opposite. Uh, in other words, it's a totally reflexive thing, it doesn't exist in and of itself. It actually is just, it's antisocial, um, it's against convention, of course convention is thought to be very good. So uh, the, the idea that witchcraft is actually the remnants of um, a real pagan religion that um, was trying to sort of coexist with Christianity in an underground fashion has really, really been very undermined and it's far more productive to look at those, um, those eras in witchcraft as something, as a way of creating an outsider community. Witchcraft is essentially an antisocial um, thing to do. So here we are, we've got, we, we get onto fairy tales, really. Um, this is, this is the, uh, what we were left with after that. We've got this beautiful illustration, um, Doré illustration of Little Red Riding Hood and the witch. And uh, as a result of all of this stuff that I've been finding out about werewolves, I started off, because I'm going to do a vodcast, and um, I started off with the real sort of actual biological creatures because I, I thought I want to start with why people have ascribed such dreadful motivations 
to actual bulls. And as a result of going through that process, I can, I'm able to introduce you to a friend of mine. Uh, this is Kea. <laughs> She's gorgeous. And um, Kea is absolutely, Kea is lovely. I went to the wolf cemetery, I called them up first, and I said, can I come and shoot your wolves? And they said, no. And I said, no, I don't mean to shoot your wolves, I mean shoot your wolves. And they, they went, oh yeah, yeah, it's fine. So they invited me down, and I went out for a walk with Kay. Now, the first thing you notice about a wolf when you first meet one is that you think, oh, it's a dog, but then it keeps walking towards you. <laughs> I mean, these things are big, and they're possibly enormous. And um, she walked towards me, and she wanted to get the measure on me. She was interested in me, so I sort of put my hand out, and she was interested in my face, so I leant over a bit. And uh, I hadn't brushed my teeth that morning because I thought she'd be offended by the kind of strong artificial smells. I thought she'd sort of want more of a, a normal human smell. So I sort of, I, I, I blew my breath at her so that she could get the smell of me. And I totally underestimated how big she was because she just leant forward and she just kissed all over my face. <laughs> so, so, so when I had recovered my composure, it was, it was really lovely. She just sort of kissed my face and then wandered off. She was bored after that. Um, so she, she's friendly, she's absolutely lovely, um, and this is Peto. Peto likes getting his bottom scratched, uh, and this is all of them, this is a family of them. So I just mention them at the end because it's been a really wonderful process for me, actually going and getting to scratch wolf bottoms and occasionally, um, occasionally getting a kiss. Uh, and, you know, to sort of find out really just how kind of the lines, the actual biological creatures have been in our uh, projection of the darkest parts of our personalities onto them. If you're interested, I did get some special wolf days sorted out for skeptics only. Um, basically, it's a, it's a talk about the wolves and the society. This is near Northampton, by the way. It's a walk around the field with Kea, uh, and she, no kiss is guaranteed, but you never know. Um, the talk on the conservation projects and uh, the wolves are fed. Um, I took the wolves some tripe for Christmas and from what I can gather, watching wolves eat is like watching anybody else throw up. It's <laughs> absolutely astonishing just how fast they eat, but there we go. Uh, so if you're interested in doing that, I know that all of the dates on the 3rd of June have been taken um, and the 20th of May may be gone, but if you're interested in doing it, come and talk to me. I organised this for QED far earlier in the month. So um, we, we'll have to do some shuffling after phone you and we'll, we'll arrange dates and all that sort of thing. But if you want to come and talk to me, it's um, 60 quid, uh, which is a discount on their normal price actually. So it's, um, it, it's a good thing being with skeptics and getting a discount. Uh, subscribe to the skeptic and enter into the draw. I left that over from QED, but now I will be sued if I don't, um, if I don't let you join in, won't I? So yeah, subscribe to the skeptic and enter the draw. So I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you understand more about wolves um, at the beginning than you did at the end. More than anything else, I hope you understand that it's all about us. Thanks.